Our next speaker won the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for developing a technique that made ultra-high powerful lasers possible. People had made high powerful lasers before, but when they turned them on, they destroyed themselves. They, parts of them melted. She found a way to fix this. And so it's with great pleasure that I bring to the stage our next speaker, Donna Strickland. So I'll start by thanking <laughs> Garrick Israeli for inviting me once again to this incredible event. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I usually talk about lasers, but uh, in keeping with the theme of Starmus Earth, I'm going to talk about a project that I'm uh, working on with Optica. Optica is an organization that um, helps optics research. Optics is the study of light. So the project is the Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring, or GEM. Optica has also partnered with AGU, which is an organization that supports research in Earth and space science. So the project is about the fact that we would like to speed up all of the measurement and monitoring that needs to be done for us to really fully understand the environment. And to do that, we're going to try to bring these two disparate groups of scientists together so the technology people can hear not what great things the environmental scientists have already discovered, but what they can't yet measure. And maybe if the optical technology people could sort of morph their technology into something slightly different, it would help the environmental scientists. So that's the point. It is a big problem. It's mostly a big problem because I can't change the slides. Ah, oh, thank you. OK, so it's a big problem because we heard, especially on Monday, we heard how big the environmental measurement uh, problem really is. Because it's not just measuring CO2 in the atmosphere. That's shown in the center. It's a beautiful picture of our Earth um, taken by Canadian astronaut David St. Jacques. The black is the um, space where nothing is. The blue sky is over top of our Earth. But it's not just that. As we also um, heard, especially from Sylvia Earle, we have to also think about the hydrosphere or the oceans, because they're changing with climate change. We also heard that really it is the ice, um, the polar extremes are the ones really feeling climate change. And with this ice melting, it's changing the hydrosphere. There's the geosphere, probably the one we're doing the least damage to, except with our fracking and our mining. But we still need to know what's going on with the volcanoes and other seismic activity. And finally, the biosphere. This is what we count on to live on this Earth. And so we want to make sure that we're protecting the biosphere. So we want to measure all of that. So now I'm going to go back more than 100 years just to quote the great Lord Kelvin. When you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So this is where the optic technology people hope to help the environmental scientists is we want to be the ones taking the measurements and providing the numbers. OK, so first, what is optics? It is the study of light. Light is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see with our eye. Now, our eye sees a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, not even in musical terms an octave, not even a factor of two out of these 24 orders of magnitude of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we in optics really didn't want to be confined to such a small part of the EM spectrum. So I'll tell you, most of us in optics think that we cover everywhere from the x-rays through the infrared. So we at least get six orders of magnitude to play with. So what's so special about light, and why do we want to use light to measure the environment? Every time light interacts with um, any kind of material, it changes the light. It can change the light in so many different ways. So what's shown here is the standard light through a prism. 
presumably this is the Brewster's angle because no light's coming off, but any other angle, light would come off and the power through the prism would change. But also, it could be absorbed by the prism material and it would change the power or the intensity. You can see that the prism also separates the colors. We can do this in more sophisticated ways and measure the spectrum of, of what's being absorbed or what's being emitted. It changes the polarization, and that's the fact that we show a light as a wave, in this case vertical, up and down, but it could be horizontal, or it could be circular, or something in between, uh, elliptical, or random. And it will change when it goes through these materials. And finally, as it's shown, the direction of propagation can change. So we could look at all these characteristics, and they all tell us something about the material the light's interacting with. Now, the question is, you know, do we want to start with something sophisticated, because that's probably expensive, or do we want to start with something pretty simple? So let's start with the age-old question, why is the sky blue, and why are the clouds white? So if you remember the picture of what I was trying to say was the atmosphere, and the black above, we always just say that's empty space. It looks black to us because the sunlight that was coming by kept on going by. It did not turn a corner and come into our eyes. But when it goes through the sky, then it, the light gets scattered by the sky and it comes into our eyes. And so the question is, why is the sky blue? Why are the clouds white? And the answer for both is scattering. But it's two different types of scattering. For the sky, the sky is blue, because, and that tells us that everything in the sky is made up of particles that are much smaller than the wavelength that we see. This is a half a micron, roughly. Your hair is about 50 microns, about 100 times smaller than that. And we know that the sky must be made up of things much smaller than that in order to have the signature. Sky blue is not just blue. And we know that if you, you know, had a can of blue paint and you wanted to make it sky blue wall, you would add white paint to it. So all the colors are coming to us, that's white, but more blue than red. So this is a signature of Rayleigh scattering. This kind of scattering is the fact that that light oscillating makes the electrons in the molecules move, and they'll move mostly along the direction of the length of the molecule. And so now the molecules are in all directions, and the light, that actually causes light to be emitted, these you know, moving charges, and it'll go perpendicular to that oscillation. So that's why the light comes in, causes the oscillation, it goes out. But blue light will cause this to happen a lot more than red light, and so that's what gives us blue sky. Now the clouds are white, and that's me scattering, and that's a signature that the particles that are doing the scattering are about the same size as the wavelength of the light, or on the order of a micron. This kind of scattering you can think of as more like playing billiard balls, and you can think of the photon coming and bouncing off another ball, and just depending on which angle it hits the ball, it goes in all directions. But because the particles are about the size of what we see, they all the different colors bounce the same, and that's why it looks white. This does not tell us, the blue sky doesn't say what kind of molecules they are. The white clouds doesn't say what the particles are made out of, because I could also ask you, why is a glass of milk white? It's also me scattering. But in the clouds, it's water droplets in uniform air. And in milk, it's milk solids in uniform water. All right, so this tells us something is there, but it doesn't tell us what the something is, but it does tell us sort of the scale of the size of the something. So just like radar, and I'm sure most of us know about radar because we've been afraid of speeding on the highway, but radar was invented for military reasons. Radar uses radio waves, and those are the longest waves in the electromagnetic spectrum, and so they're sort of a meter or bigger. And so then the me scattering has to be from something that's sort of a meter size or bigger. This is why we can see planes and ships and cars with radar. And we can map out the three-dimensional object because the time it takes to get there and get back tells us the di that dimension. And then, of course, we can scan or image to get the other two dimensions. This is the same with something called LIDAR, where R stands for radio and L stands for light. We're now using a green laser beam. We raster scan across the space. If it, something comes back, 
a particle was there about the size of a half micron or less. And we can look for it. We can also say um, how dense it is by how strong the signal comes back. We can say how deep it is by the length of time pulse that's shown over there on the right, how long it is, how dense it is, how wide it is. So this is what we can use to find something is there. It's not a very sophisticated instrument. And so we could use this instrument to say, is there even a reason to bring a more complicated instrument there? So this is one that I've got from my colleagues at Institut National d'Optique in uh, Quebec. So they've uh, developed this ultraviolet spectroscopic LIDAR. They're looking for nitrous oxides, a pollutant in our natural gas compressor stations. I think they knew the leak was probably already there. I'm not going to go through the details of this slide, but just to point out, there are numbers on this slide. The point is we can know what the concentration is, and it's spectroscopic, which I haven't explained yet, but they can know what it is. How do you know what it is? Every molecule has a vibrational and rotational spectrum. So quantum, which you just heard a lot about just before me, but all of these uh, energy levels are distinct levels, and we can see um, it, by looking at for that exact spectral fingerprint which of the molecules we're looking at. So we've heard about methane already this week. Unfortunately, it's kind of dark blue on black, so you may not see methane. CO2 is there in bright red. And so you could look for these signatures if this is what you're looking for. Are we looking for it? There it is. So this is my colleagues at the National Research Council in Canada. You'll see that I'm giving you most of Canadian uh, data. So again, what we're trying to do is have a lot of measurements. And so we want to have them small and not so expensive and easily portable. So this is showing that they have a small uh, diode laser that can have a very narrow line to look for those quantum uh, blips, but it can be tuned across any one of these transitions to look for what they want. And so they've looked for CO2 or methane, hydrogen fluoride. They can have it for industrial applications, agricultural applications, and they've even uh, put it on a NASA flight to Mars. I don't know why they're looking for methane on Mars, but for whatever reason, it was sent to Mars to look for methane. So this is the uh, point bet uh, behind the GEM initiative. If you want to know more, there's a website there. The point is we want to gather not only environmental scientists with um, sensor technology people, doesn't have to always be optics, so that we can get all these measurements that we need in order to have better climate modeling. We want the technology development people there. We want industry there, both the ones that are causing maybe some of the pollution, so they're there to know what's going on, and they'll do something with that information. But we also want the technology to be developed so that it can be made uh, rapidly and used for this detection. I've said at the beginning, numbers are important. So we want the international standards people also involved with this network so that we make sure that each one of the sensors are calibrated so that the numbers are real. And so the last piece of it is that we really want government policy people with us in the network. We want to know that if they're going to make a policy change, that we measure before and we measure after the policy change so we can see that maybe their idea worked. We can also see if there's unintended consequences. We also want to make sure that the policy changes they want to make are always being driven by the data that we're taking. So this is the idea of the whole group. I'm not good with this clicker, though. Oh, there we are. So this is one of my favorite examples. It's also coming from one of the Canadian nodes of the GEM network at University Laval in Quebec. University Laval, was, I knew all along, was well known for its optics and photonics research. What I did not know until more recently is that Laval is also known for Arctic biology. And University Laval said, you know, we have this chance to get this money if we do something really big. OK, you think it's that? It could just be me. Anyway, um, let's put the two big groups together and make them even stronger. And so they've started this uh, uh, project, Sentinel North. This particular project is also a collaboration with CNRS in uh, France. So what does this picture show us? It's one spot on the Earth. It's called the Green Edge Ice Camp in, in the northern part of Canada where in the winter time, and it's going to go, time is horizontal, and this is just a picture of the space. 
And I guess sometimes there's polar bears and sometimes there's seals and sometimes the scientists are there, presumably not all at the same time. But if you see, before April, there's 1.2 meters of ice, so they can all be on this ice. The project is about studying the spring bloom of the phytoplankton. So don't ask me anything about this uh, from a biology point of view, but you can see that it's sort of laid out on the right-hand side here is that algae forms into bacteria, into phytoplankton, and it feeds the food chain down to the fish and something called benthic fauna. And if Sylvia Earle was here, she could probably tell you what that is, but I don't know what benthic fauna is. But the point is these Arctic biologists want to not only study the spring bloom of the phytoplankton, but really understand how climate change, which is causing the ice to melt sooner, is changing this spring bloom of the phytoplankton. And so what you see here is that from April to July, you start getting holes now in mid-May, and that's when the algae starts, and then by July, the ice is gone and the phytoplankton is growing. The point of this slide for me really is the fact that this is only on one spot on the Earth, and we're just trying to study one part of the change due to climate going on this Earth. One part of the biosphere is what they're trying to study, and the change of this biosphere is because of the change of the ice, the change of the water temperature, because of the change of the air temperature. And so just to study this one biosphere part, one spot on the Earth, look how many measurements it takes for that one project. The ones encircled are the photonics ones that were developed for the project, so there are other all sensors as well. But it takes this enormous number of sensors to do this one project on one spot on the Earth, and this is why we want to see if we can uh, increase the growth. So another one of the nodes is at uh, Berkeley, uh, Professor Cohen has uh, got these now, what we're going to call low-cost sensors to measure different uh, pollutants in the air. He's got them on a two-kilometer grid all over the San Francisco Bay Area. He's, his research really did show how the pollution did go way down in the COVID times. It also talks about how the need for maybe better traffic control at all of those many bridges. So. He's developed this. He's also got a lot of models to help show where the pollutants are coming from. And the point of the GEM network is then to say, do other places want to do the same thing? And so uh, Professor Mitchie and Ferguson at uh, University of Strathclyde in uh, Glasgow, and they are using the same detectors, and they are using the same models now in Glasgow. They also, both groups, have public policy people with them on, in their uh, nodes. There was some discussion, and I was pretty excited about this. At one time, at one of these meetings, I heard that the public policy people in Glasgow were actually thinking about making a policy that you could no longer drive your kids to school, because they could all see how much pollution there was when the cars came and went from the schools. Apparently, that did not actually happen. But the other great thing about this one is that I think it's a great example of citizen science as well. Not only are we getting the research about um, the pollutants going on in, in this area, but the students themselves are getting to see the data and understand the data. So on t they use these uh, same um, models that was developed by Professor Cohen's group at Berkeley. They can look back and see from the measured detector, knowing about uh, the various weather patterns and what other information, they can figure out where all of the pollutants are coming from. So this is just a map now of where we are in forming GEM nodes to make the whole GEM network. The colored ones are present ones. The one in sort of southern um, Ontario and Canada there is the one that we've just started at the University of Waterloo, but we just started it this month, so <laughs> I'm not showing anything from that one. Um, I helped get started the one that's still not colored in Madagascar. I gave a talk like this at the National Academy of Sciences in the United States to the engineering science section, and a mathematician there said, oh, I have a friend who's a biologist in Madagascar. She would love to work on this. And they would like to work with this, but what the San Francisco group calls a low-cost detector is not exactly what you would call a low-cost detector in Madagascar. And neither AGU nor Optica fund the research projects. They help us network together, but we're still looking to see if we can help the people in Madagascar. We're hoping to link these and find more, um, but that's the point of this project.
And I think that's where I end. That's it. These are the acknowledgments, and thank you very much.